Um, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for uh, today's afternoon bell. Um, my name is Ellen Desmond and I work in the Bureau of Student Wellness at the New Hampshire Department of Education. Our team will be joining you via YouTube live stream Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays at 3 p.m. This is new. We were on Facebook Live. We will be posting the link um, to this YouTube broadcast on uh, the event pages that we create on Facebook, uh, but we're going to house them all on YouTube. So check us out there if you aren't already there. Um, the afternoon bell is an opportunity to discuss issues with some of our community partners and uh, provide supports to New Hampshire educators, New Hampshire families, um, and those in the community while New Hampshire learns remotely. Um, and we did just get the word from the governor that uh, we will be in remote learning mode through the balance of the school year. So mm -hmm. our office is gonna work hard to continue these sessions to provide you with lots of resources and supports um, and connections to your community resources as uh, we move along. You can find, like I said, all of our live broadcasts um, as well as our previously recorded ones on our YouTube channel, which is NH Student Wellness. We encourage you to follow us on Twitter at NH Schools and on Facebook at NH Student Wellness, where you can also find our live morning coffee chats uh, weekdays at 9 a.m. And you can find a wealth of other resources. Uh, we have some great community partners that we love to cross post with folks um, when they share resources with us. And the department as a whole is also updating our remote learning website, uh, nhlearnsremotely.com. So check that out for info about remote instruction and supports. Today, during our afternoon bell session, our topic is the CONNECT program, suicide risk response. And so we're going to focus on risk and protective factors, warning signs for suicide, and national, state, and local resources with NAMI New Hampshire. So we have with us Ann Duckless, who is NAMI uh, New Hampshire's Community Educator and Prevention Specialist, and Kelly Caravona, who is the Suicide Prevention Coordinator for the New Hampshire Nexus Project 2.0 Garrett Lee Stewart Program. Both Ann and Kelly have extensive experience in suicide prevention and postvention response. So we are so excited to have them on our afternoon bell session today. So welcome Ann and Kelly, and I'll let you take it away. Excellent, thank you. So I'm Kelly Caravona and I am part of the New Hampshire Nexus 2.0 project, uh, the Garrett Lee Smith program. And I have joined the NAMI team with a public health background and a background in education. So really a shout out to all of the educators out there who are navigating this virtual world with your students. You truly are part of that group of heroes that, that we talk about very regularly in navigating this new landscape. So, um, I, I do come from a public health background, so we'll be talking a little bit about that, especially in terms of those risk and protective factors. And you're a hard act to follow, Kelly. Um, so I'm Ann Duckless. Um, I've been with um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness um, in here in New Hampshire, um, doing mental health trainings, um, suicide prevention and postvention trainings for the past 14 years. And prior to that, I uh, worked for over 20 years in the field of substance use and addictions. And I worked um, in a K through 12 school here in New Hampshire uh, for 15 years. So um, I joined Kelly in, that's how I cut my teeth professionally. And um, it's just such a pleasure. Um, thank you to um, the Department of Education. It's such a pleasure to collaborate with you um, in this afternoon, Bill. It's just really cool. <laughs> it is. We, we agree. We're, we're really psyched that you're on. And um, this, honestly, this remote learning time has really given us a chance to reconvene with all of our community partners. And um, we, of course, count you as, as one of those, those community partners. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it's really important to talk about um, the discussion we're going to have today. You know, suicide is really personal and can be an emotional issue. Um, typically, when we have a connect training, a face-to-face -face training, um, we would identify a resource person in the room, someone who could just uh, check in with participants as they're talking about some of the conversations, you know, the material, and as they're going through the program. Clearly, um, that's a bit more challenging in this environment. So really, I think it's important just to understand 
that it is highly likely that there are lost survivors um, tuning into session today, perhaps some um, attempt survivors. Really important to know that when we talk about the topic of suicide, it can feel really heavy. And sometimes you might not even know it feels heavy until much, much after, you know, later on in the afternoon, you might just be relaxing and reflecting on some of the discussion and it, and it can truly feel um, a bit heavy for you. So we just want to ensure that everyone um, takes an opportunity to practice some good self-care if you're finding you're needing it. In terms of suicide, um, whenever we host these trainings, um, I, I really truly love this slide because uh, my background, very similar to Anne's as she shared, is in substance misuse prevention. And part of the, um, the training that we do talks about language. Language really matters when talking about mental health and substance misuse, um, suicide. It, it really can be highly stigmatizing and it can be a barrier in individuals' willingness to open up about their experiences or try to access any kind of help for those. So I love this slide and this portion of the, the presentation because this is an opportunity for anyone, regardless of their comfort level, to really dig into some of these protocols and the things that we're gonna talk about. Because at these trainings, often folks will come to me and say, well, I really wanna change, I wanna do something, what can I do? And this is what I always start with. There, there's certainly a lot more that folks can do. We can all be a connection. But I think just the way we talk about suicide can really make the difference for folks. Um, if we talk about it in a safe and uh, destigmatizing way and avoid terms like you see there, a successful suicide. Well, when we hear the word successful, that implies good things, right? Successful maybe in school or at your job or successful relationships in your life. And a suicide death is clearly never successful or, or a good thing. We try to avoid words like committed because often committed uh, a crime. Again, it sort of has that negative tone and feeling to it. I've had a really um, extensive opportunities to connect with survivors of suicide oh. loss. And sometimes that language just really feels uncomfortable for them. So it's a way to think about um, people first, person-centered language, and use terms that are just a bit more sensitive and a bit less likely to stigmatize it. We want to normalize the conversations, but we want to do so safely and respectfully. And I want to just add something. Thank you, Kelly. I just want to add so that, you know, here we are doing this in collaboration with the Department of Education and suicide, the public health issue just like cancer, just like diabetes. And when I look at the right-hand side of the terms to avoid, we would never say a successful cancer death. We would never say a successful diabetes death. We would just say a diabetes death or death by diabetes or um, cancer. Um, and I, I go right back to what Kelly said, that this is such a highly stigmatized, highly shaming um, public health issue and if we can um, change language to reflect greater sensitivity and, um, and, and greater um, compassion, just like we would for diabetes and heart disease, I agree with Kelly, that's the first step in making a difference in saving lives. Absolutely. And actually, Ann, that really nicely supplements what we're going to say with this next part. You know, when Ann refers to that public health approach, we're really lucky here in New Hampshire. We have a really robust approach um, and an infrastructure in place for public health. There are 13 regional public health networks throughout the state of New Hampshire, all there working on various public health issues. And really, if you look at the public health approach, it really does seek to improve the health and safety of all individuals by addressing those underlying risk factors for anything. Um, so the focus truly is on prevention. Um, it's on health promotion. And we're really looking at it at a community level. Can I, can I jump in for a sec? Please. I, um, I am so glad that you mentioned the public health network. And I also want to add too that, um, it's so important for folks at home to know that the community mental health centers are open and they are so willing to help folks. Same with public health networks that, you know, just because business maybe look a little bit different, 
Um, you know, crisis services still are available for folks. Mm -hmm. um, the the CMHCs, um, you know, they they're they're still up and running. So just as a reminder to people, hopefully, you know, that dispels any rumors out there um, that you know that this state does have does have uh, folks on staff who are working just as hard as they normally do. <laughs> That's right. That is an excellent point, and especially during um, these times. Which, which are unfamiliar to us, right? This is really unprecedented. And it's important for folks to know that the services that have been in place are still there, especially at a time where you might need them even more so. And I'm glad to hear you say that about the regional public health networks, um, the mention of them. I, I was on a meeting with one of the regional public health networks just this morning, and they are there um, not only working through some of this um, COVID-19 issues that are going on, but also looking at how to still support schools um, and other sectors in making sure families and our students are still connected to the things they need, even though they're in the virtual learning environment. So excellent point. And did you have anything you wanted to add there? Only that um, there are 13 um, public health networks like um, Kelly talked about in our state, and there are 10 community mental health centers, and they kind of overlap um, in different regions around the state. They sure do, excellent point. The, the maps don't always line up, but the services are certainly there. So that's an excellent point too. And in terms of males, you know, it's interesting, oftentimes society really, I think sometimes implies these expectations that um, with males and, and having some mental health issues or really um, expecting males to be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and, and um, making sure that they can sort of get through their problems maybe more quietly and not really encouraging those help seeking behaviors. And, and that's something that this training and, and this presentation really looks to help folks understand that there are times we all um, need help, we all need support and we could all benefit from tapping into those services that are there. So I think sometimes um, um, with males because of those expectations, um, whether perceived or really there in your face a lot of the time, they, they're a lot less likely sometimes to communicate their needs and, and to be willing to reach out and get that help. And the other thing I would add here is, I'm sure um, the listening audience has heard about um, the higher risk for military members in our country for suicide. Well, the number one um, reason for military members not talking about mental health issues or suicide risk and not seeking help. The number one reason is stigma. So again, that's where our language can lead us to help, um, to help demonstrate sensitivity and compassion so we can have those discussions. So hopefully people can connect to resources versus facing a no-win situation if it comes to um, uh, if, if it comes to suicide risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So truly uh, the goal of the CONNECT program and, and we're just, you know, this is a very small presentation and, and incorporating pieces of that, but really we just want to empower people to recognize those risk factors and warning signs, connect with an individual at risk and feel confident and comfortable to do so. Um, and then connect that person to the appropriate community resource or professional agency that can assist with that. Um, again, really bringing it back to the public health approach here. There's a lot of prevention, health promotion, and community connection to this. Because as Ann said, you know, that stigma can exist, you know, not just at the societal level, but really within an individual's home or the community or their work environment, right? A reluctance to reach out and get help because they're fearful that perhaps at work, there could be some recourse of some nature. So I think that's important to understand that it impacts us all and it really takes that community public health approach to, to deal with it. So risk factors, um, as many folks know, risk factors are characteristics of a person and or their environment um, that are going to increase that risk um, for suicide. So some of the major risk factors for suicide would include um, a previous attempt, substance misuse, uh, mental health issues, access to means, lethal means, a family history of suicide or losing someone they know that was dear to them, a friend to suicide, social isolation, 
which is, you know, a, a topic a lot of us are talking about now, especially in this virtual online learning environment. It's a bit more challenging to connect with our friends with some of the restrictions right now. Chronic disease or disability, uh, a lack of access to quality health care. And did you have any to add? Um, the only thing I would add to that is in the research, transitions are a huge, huge piece. Um, and the reason is, is when you have those warm handoffs in terms of a person at risk for suicide directly connecting with the next um, level or the next step in that process, that really reduces risk tremendously. So transitions is actually where we can lose people because we don't have that warm handoff or accompanying that person to the next step, to the next person, to the next agency. Um, it's like cutting the dots. You know, if, if we identify a person at risk for suicide, then we really want to actually walk that person, connect that person, actually, you know, actually make that connection possible for that person. Um, and that reduces the risk for transition. Absolutely. Excellent points. So after just talking about risk factors, protective factors are exactly the opposite. So we're looking at um, personal or environmental characteristics that help protect an individual from suicide. So this would be clearly access to effective health care, connectedness to peers, family, or the greater community, uh, life skills. So uh, problem solving, coping skills, the ability to adapt to change. Change is hard for all of us, but really being able to adapt as best you can. Uh, a sense of self-esteem, you know, having really a sense of purpose or meaning to your life is, is, is really important. Um, cultural or personal beliefs that discourage suicide. So when we talked about that, I, I love this slide as well, because this legislature, we know legislation is a really significant community protective factor but it ties back again to that language matters, the way we talk about these things and the expectations we have around some of these really complex public health problems, they can really um, make a, a more supportive environment through legislation overall. Um, if you look at the slide there, you know, establishing education and training requirements that really help to cultivate a knowledgeable and confident group of professionals that can respond effectively to individuals at suicide risk. And I think educators, what, what better uh, touch point for a lot of our, our young folks today? They're, they're interfacing with them on a fairly regular basis, hopefully daily, and if not, certainly weekly. And what are the opportunities there? Which is why I think that, that you know, the bill that really does require that two hours of suicide prevention training every year, I, I would I'm hoping that we build on it even more. And a lot of districts that I've worked with, they go well beyond that two hours. They really want to provide those nurturing environments and cultivate that, you know, that warm culture at the school level so that folks feel, our young folks are feeling part of it. They have a voice in it. They're welcome. So with that, actually leading right into that is that school environment. You know, school is definitely a place where we can really increase and beef up those protective factors. Um, they can really be strengthened in the school environment. It's really all about building a culture that's welcoming, uh, that's positive, that definitely ensures safety of all students and staff. Uh, it includes students um, really at the table identifying what that culture is and what happens when we, we detract from that cultural expectation within the building. How do we handle that? What does that look like? Having students around the table and their voices involved in all of that, I think not only increases buy-in on that level, but they're all sort of responsible for one another and ensuring that they're really adding to a good, healthy, positive environment. The other thing I would add in my um, connections with school staff and leadership across the state, um, I have been very impressed with virtual connections that counselors, teachers, um, it, all kinds of, uh, of different staff and um, established developing and um, creating with youth in this COVID-19 crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. 
So I certainly recognize, you know, when we look at regular meal times at home, um, I recognize that there are all sorts of families today. We have grandparents that are raising grandkids, right? They're parenting a second time around as a result of maybe some substance misuse issues um, and, and substance use disorders. And so families look really different today. And, and that, that's wonderful. And there are opportunities to really connect with kids. When we look at prevention, and I especially kind of refer to my um, substance misuse prevention training, we talked about just those ongoing conversations. This truly is just about connection. So even if dinner is on the go, on the way to soccer practice or on the way to the therapist appointment, if that's okay, if there's an opportunity for some good dialogue and connection between caregiver and that youth, I think it really makes all the difference in just maintaining a, a good, healthy balance of what's happening. You know, how can I support with this? Just staying connected. Would you agree? And this slide really is mm -hmm. more about connection. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what I really like about what you said, Kelly, is um, not only when you have that regular connection with young people, not only are you um, offsetting that risk for suicide, but you're also offsetting the risk for substance use involvement, for fighting, for all other kinds of negative behaviors. So, so many of these cut across other issues um, pertaining to public health as well. And that's an excellent point. And that's a lot of thing, you know, when, when I have worked with schools and when I've talked to a lot of parents and being a parent myself, sometimes engaging in these conversations can be really challenging, right? At the end of the day, whether the virtual day or the more traditional school day we're familiar with, you know, by the time you get to your learner, your students, it's like, so how was your day? They're done, right? It's like, oh, it was good. <laughs> it's really teasing out a bit more yeah, from yeah. those one answer. Yeah, I learned a lot. It was great. Finding yeah. opportunities to do that. And it's all about frequency, right? It's all about, it doesn't have to be. In fact, we find best practice is not lengthy conversations where you're gonna lose um, those young folks, but really just often connecting. And it can be mm -hmm. short blasts of that, but just regular check-ins, especially around mental health. I have to be honest, um, I've been in this field for quite a long time and an educator prior to that, I worked with very um, high-risk youth and families uh, locally here in the Lakes region. And even I was uncomfortable prior to a lot of my training to engage in some of these conversations with my own children. I never thought I'd ask very pointed and direct questions that we know is best practice, but I thought, well, how do I answer that if they say yes? And that's what all this is about. It's just about providing the tools people need to have these conversations to feel competent and confident to do so and to keep them going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Kelly talked about the risk factors and the protective factors. And um, this is when those risk factors are starting to kind of pile up um, in a way that is going to be even more concerning for warning signs for suicide. So you can see that if I'm having difficulties at school or work, if I'm neglecting the way I look, um, not taking care of myself, not, not brushing my teeth, not combing my hair, all of those things, if I'm dropping out of things that I used to like to do, um, that is definitely going to increase my risk for suicide. It's not yet a warning, but it's a time for people who are in my life in whatever um, capacity they are, friends, family, community members, school staff, it's time for people to, to indicate, wow, something's off with Anne. I really think to connect her to this person or that resource in order to address what's going on with her. The sudden improvement in mood after being down or withdrawn, that's something that all of us as gate really need to be attuned to. So when somebody has depression, when somebody has anxiety or suicide risk, they don't snap out of it. Just like with cancer or diabetes, we need some kind of medical intervention, some kind of therapy, some kind of um, medication um, involvement, but people don't typically snap out of these kinds of mental health conditions. And so if I do look that like, uh, you know, I am doing well after not doing well for so long and, and people know that I haven't seen any kind of um, medical professional or any kind of medication, then 
what might be happening with my son improvement in mood is that now I have thought about when, where, and how I would take my life. And now the emotional pain doesn't control me, I control it. So that any time where I can't take it anymore, I can now pull out all the stops. So this is really important for all of us in whatever capacity we are, because it's important to know people don't snap out of it, have to have that conversation more with them about, well, what is changed with Anne in the fact that, you know, you're doing better, but you're feeling better, you're looking better, you're talking um, in, a, in a more improved manner, but you haven't sought any kind of help. You haven't gotten any kind of medications. So it's having that dialogue when we see this increase. And certainly if I was giving away any kind of my possession, it's kind of like I'm trying to wrap things up um, before uh, putting myself in harm's way. Um, so what we wanna look at is how those risk factors come together and any changes in behavior and mood that we might observe in whatever way we're related to the person so that we can have a conversation with them um, and get them help. Um, when we approach warning signs and statements for suicide, I call this like the iceberg theory because we know that icebergs, the characteristic is that 90% of the iceberg is beneath the water. That is all of the risk factors that Kelly was talking about. So we don't have to worry about what's underneath the water, but the 10% above the water, that's what we may hear somebody say, or we may watch somebody do. And that's the warning signs that we need to take active um, measures to get the person connected to help. It's very much like a person having tingling in their left arm or heaviness on their chest. We don't indicate, well, we're going to wait for more signs to come along. We know that's the 10% ice that this person might be having a heart attack, and we've got to get the, them connected to medical help sooner rather than later. So warning signs specific to schools, um, and of course, this isn't necessarily virtual um, with some of these things. But again, any kind of assignments, any kind of conversations or um, any kind of interactions that um, we have with students, certainly, and certainly um, on social media uh, platforms or in virtual learning capacity, um, that might be an area where we hear or see these warning signs. And of course, if we hear about a youth who is having a really bad time with their peers, or they've just had some kind of behavioral um, uh, intervention by parents uh, or guardians or by the school itself, um, if they've had a bad report card or performance review. Um, those are the things that we want to know that can put the person at greater risk um, just because they're in a really bad spot right now. So the kind of the, the tingling in the left arm is if anybody is talking about death, dying, or suicide, uh, they're looking for ways to take their life, they're talking about it, they're writing it, they're tweeting it, they're texting it, Snapchatting, Instagram, regardless of how they're communicating, this is the tingling of the left arm. This is the heaviness on the chest. It's the 10% of that iceberg that we really want to get other people involved to help save this life and to keep this person safe, frankly. So if that person is in immediate danger, we may need to call 911, just as if they were having a medical emergency with a heart attack. We may need to get them to the emergency department for that mental health evaluation. And we want eyes on the person at all times, even in the bathroom. Because again, with a person who's having a heart attack, we are not going to lose sight of them until we turn them over to the ambulance, to the emergency department personnel, or kind of like that warm handoff that I talked about earlier. And then these are the feelings that we might hear uh, the person. And of course, virtually speaking, this is where many um, school staff might hear from um, students in this 
distance learning environment. We might hear great hopelessness or having no goals in life or no purpose in life, no reason for living. Like the person's trapped. Honestly, and you, uh, for this feeling trapped, it's almost like if you sense what this person is saying, you sense that there's no light at the end of the tunnel or like the walls are closing in, that is that feeling trapped. And if you're feeling it in your gut, guaranteed there's something going on with the person in front of you in terms of this warning sign. Um, uncontrollable anger or rage might come across. Um, let's say there's a relationship up, I'll get back at him or my parents give me an unfair punishment and I'm very upset about it and I'm going to show them. I'll get back at them. So these are these are cues that we can pick up in any capacity um, and have a dialogue, ongoing discussion with what's going on with that person who is now in distress. And these are behaviors that we might hear from the person. So, yeah, well, I didn't even, you know, why does it bother? I don't have to do my assignments. I don't have to do my homework. It really matter. Uh, my parents are bugging me to do the chores around home, but I don't really care about it. Oh my gosh. If I heard that, I would be following up with an incredible dialogue and discussion about what I'm hearing. Obviously, you hear about increased use of alcohol or any kind of, um, the person is now isolated from others. They're spending more time in their, uh, they're not showing up on distance learning platforms. Um, they're not accepting any kind of, um, you know, any kind of virtual reality connection with their friends in this environment. Um, they just are, are just kind of pulling themselves back from everything. That is a clear warning sign. Um, sleeping. So this is something that we really need to be attuned to uh, about sleep. Obviously, if I slept 12 hours a day, people in my life would know something was up. But the same thing happens with sleep deprivation. If I'm only getting three or four hours of sleep a night, if I'm pacing the floors at night, if I'm on my screens at all hours of uh, the night and early morning, what happens to the brain is that it, that sleep deprivation looks like alcohol intoxication. And what happens with alcohol intoxication is judgment is the first brain faculty to go. So now I'm struggling with depression. I can't sleep. I'm pacing the floors at night or I'm spending a lot of time on screen time. And in my sleep deprived brain, which has no judgment, I start to think that I'm going to be doing my family and friends a favor if I took my life. That is what we want to respond to with that sleep deprivation and what it can do to a person being at, at greater risk for suicide. And finally, anxiety or agitation. Um, certainly, anxiety, as Kelly talked about in this current COVID-19 climate, is something to be mindful of. Um, and also, it's like that agitation. I'm jumping out of my skin. I just, I, I'm not doing well with my emotions around anxiety, worry, agitation. And you can just feel it bubbling um, this, this person. It's just, it, that's when we really want to help that person um, in terms of how are they going to control this anxiety and agitation that is consuming them. And I think if I could just add quickly Please. for the anxiety piece, especially in this environment, you know, we shared at the beginning um, that that it looks like for the rest of the school year, you know, we'll be doing some online learning. There's going to be some real feelings of anxiousness around that. And especially as Anne mentioned, you know, and I think Anne was speaking a little more specifically, maybe about transitions um, in a continuum of care and during a care path and war hand, warm handoffs. But even transitions from maybe going from elementary into middle school or eighth grade into high school, when we look at these high school seniors that are either entering the workforce, military, college or university, um, or really are unsure of what they mm -hmm. want to do at this point, these times of transition 
can put people at risk for both substance misuse and suicide anyway. Now add that we're in an environment that's a little uncertain to us right now. So essentially seniors in high school have just learned that their end of year activities may look, are likely going to look very different than perhaps they traditionally would. Now, not only is that sense of loss there, but what is the fear or the worry around what college looks like come August and September? Um, mm -hmm. These are very real things that they're gonna be navigating over the next few months. And, and there's going to be feelings of anxiousness around that. So this is where some of that dialogue that we talked about really comes in handy, not just for parents, caregivers, grandparents, but for educators who are connecting mm -hmm. with students virtually just that check-in. How are things going? I know this looks like this is the rest of the year. How are you all feeling about that? Mm -hmm. Some really great outreach, um, school social workers, the counseling department and superintendents and principals really saying, hey, we, we've still got these services up and running. Let, let's tap in and some nice little snippets here and there on social media about how to roll with this a little bit. It's challenging. And I think we need to recognize for these folks that it's it's a bit of a crummy situation, but that, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, we're gonna work to really support each other through this time, but recognizing that it is crummy and that there are gonna be feelings about that. So excellent point, Anne. Thank you. So if I came straight out and said, uh, I wanna take my life, people know right where I stand. But again, as we've been talking about, this is such a stigmatizing, labeling, um, shaming, um, public health issue that most people are more likely to drop a hint. Like no one would care if I was gone or people would be much better without me. See, hopefully now that people are hearing the warning signs, you hear it in your gut because this is not what happens in our head. It's in our gut. When somebody says a warning sign around me or they talk to me about a warning sign that was said to them from somebody else, young or older, I hear it in my gut. And when I feel the butterflies in my gut, that's when I know something is off. And we really need to follow that up more with discussion, dialogue, and perhaps connecting that person to resources. So when a student is identified as suicidal, who's responsible? Well, of course, our point is that we all have the responsibility to respond. And that's not just school staff, it's also family members, it's also community members. It's anybody who comes into contact with the person at any point in their day-to-day -day life. And what we really wanna talk about is not worrying alone. Um, even the most experienced clinician among us in the suicide prevention field would never deal with suicide risk in a person young or older by themselves. So the question to ask is, who do I know or trust that can help me and advise me in this situation? And so, whoops, sorry, went too fast. So this slide right here, this chart of community resources is a lot of the resources, both locally and nationally, that any of us, young or older, can access. And we really wanna highlight the Crisis Addiction Line 211 here in New Hampshire for any kind of substance use issues. Um, we really wanna talk about the suicide, the lifeline, the National Suicide uh, Prevention Lifeline 1-800-273-8255, which is answered up in Lebanon in our state. Um, and then the crisis text line, um, which is text 741741. Um, those can be life-saving initiatives, but they can also be um, resources that anyone who is concerned about somebody at risk for suicide can access. So if I'm a family member, I could call the Suicide Lifeline, or if I'm an educator, I could text the crisis text line. So it's not just for the person who is at risk. And now we have a three and a half minute video clip from the Mayo Clinic, which pretty much summarizes so much of what Kelly and I have been talking about. Can I am my ups and downs, yes. just like anybody else. Maybe more than anybody else. I can be hard to figure out. And I like my privacy. I don't want you looking over my shoulder all the time. But you know your kid better than anybody else. And if you think he's acting different than usual. Acting really down? 
crying all the time for no good reason. Or getting really mad. Not able to sleep or sleeping too much. Shutting her friends out or giving her stuff away. Acting reckless, drinking, using drugs, staying out late. Suddenly not doing stuff he used to love. Or doing stuff that's just not like him. It might be nothing to worry about. It might just be high school. Or it might be something more. He might be depressed. Not just feeling down, really depressed. It might be that your kid is thinking about killing himself. It happens, more than you think, more than it should. And people say, I had no idea. I thought it was just a phase he was going through. I never thought she'd do it. I wish he'd come to me. I wish he'd said something. I wish I'd said something. When it's too late. So if you think your kid's acting different, if she seems like a different person, say something. Say, what's wrong? How can I help? And ask straight out, are you thinking about killing yourself? It doesn't hurt to ask. In fact, it helps. When people are thinking about killing themselves, they want somebody to ask. They want somebody to care. Maybe you're afraid you'll make it worse if you ask. Like, you'll put the idea in their head. Believe me, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't hurt to ask. In fact, the best way to keep a teenager from killing herself is to ask, are you thinking about killing yourself? And what if they say yes? Or maybe. Or sometimes? Well, here's what you don't say. That's crazy. Don't be such a drama queen. You're making too much of this. That boy's not worth killing yourself over. That's not going to solve anything. You're just trying to get attention. You're not going to kill yourself. What you do say is, I'm sorry you're feeling so bad. How can I help? We'll get through this together. Let's keep you safe. A lot of people think about killing themselves, adults and kids. Most of them never try it, but some of them do. So if your kid says, I'd be better off dead. I can't live with this. I'm going to kill myself. Take her seriously. Find someone she can talk to about it. Someone who knows how to help. Sometimes kids want to kill themselves because something happened. A breakup, a failure. But sometimes it goes deeper, and it's not going to go away by itself. Get some help. Talk to your doctor. Or a counselor at school. Or your minister. But don't just let it drop. And make sure that your kid always has someone to turn to. Someone he trusts. Make a list together, right then. Three, four, five names. Put a suicide hotline number on there, too. Have him keep that list in his wallet so he always knows where to turn. Make sure your home is safe. If you have pills she could use to hurt herself, lock them up. If you have a gun, don't just lock it up. Get it out of the house. The bullets, too. And one more thing. If you think your kid might be about to hurt himself, don't leave him alone. Take him to the emergency room. Call 911 if you have to. We all have our ups and downs, but sometimes it's more than that. If you think something's wrong, the only way to find out is to ask. Ask straight out. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Don't wait until you're sure. Trust your gut, because it never hurts to ask. And it can make a big difference. All the difference. In your kid's life. Okay, so with that, um, that also applies for uh, young and older individuals who might be at risk. So even though they were talking about youth suicide prevention, we're really talking about all ages and having that discussion. Um, you can, there's the URL at the top of the slide, um, but you can also Google Mayo Clinic suicide prevention clip and it will come up in YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, the next five slides are Kelly and my um, attempt at acknowledging the current COVID-19 climate uh, that may be incredibly um, anxiety provoking um, with depression, perhaps. Um, and this comes from a document that was uh, generated by the AFSP.org, which is the website at the top of your slide. Uh, that stands for the American Foundation. Um, for suicide prevention. Um, and they had this document about the five ways that we can help our own mental health and well being um, through this COVID 19 crisis. So, um, first is separate what is in your control from what is not. And that might be many different factors, uh, but we've included limiting our consumption of news uh, when we can um, and when it's going to be healthy for us. Um, second is doing what helps you 
feel a sense of safety, whatever that is, because this is such an unsafe time for young and older globally. Um, so in this um, slide, uh, taking our vitamins, we might feel that that increases our safety, increases our strength uh, with this um, public health issue we're dealing with with the coronavirus. Get outside in nature. Vitamin B and fresh air are essential for us as human beings, young and older. Um, also, any kind of exercise also elevates both our physical and our mental health well being. Challenge yourself to stay in the present. This is something that the, st the school staff out there know all too well because of all the work you've done with students uh, around mindfulness, around staying in the present, um, maybe even about some grounding practices with their breathing and centering themselves. Um, this helps us stay grounded in the moment and that helps with anxiety, depression. And then lastly, uh, but most important, as you could tell from the message that uh, Kelly and I have been um, imparting to you today, is stay connected with supportive others and reach out for help if you need more support. Uh, none of us has to be alone with our worries. None of us, and, and that might be with suicide risk, with anxiety, with depression, um, or with this COVID-19 climate. None of us needs to be alone. Um, Kelly and I have included other websites and resources here on slide 28, uh, national resources and websites, as well as more local here with the NAMINH.org um, or the Connect Program website. And then finally, these are many, many uh, LGBTQ resources um, nationally as well. Kelly, anything to add? Excellent. I, I think that's been really comprehensive. And I, I just, you know, wanted to say again, I'm so appreciative of all the educators who have really had to everyone, you know, ensuring that our students have lunches, that they have connection, that mm -hmm. services are still being provided. It's, it's a challenging time, but as a state, I'm really proud of, of where we're at. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, had an opportunity to work really closely with some educators over the years having been one and I it's just a sector that has my heart anyway so especially during these times I'm so appreciative of all the efforts to support our younger folks and their families. Yep so back to you Ellen. Thank you that was wonderful what a great recap of just things to be on the lookout for mm -hmm. and especially during this time of of remote learning um just the awareness of being hyper vigilant, and you know, I always come back every time we talk to our part our partners about the value of just creating those relationships with young people and having those conversations. Um, you know, all of that. We know that the number one protective factor for young people is a positive relationship with at least mm -hmm. one adult. That's all it takes. I know that absolutely feels like a big ask, but that's all it takes. And mm -hmm. so um, it's so important, I think, for all of us to consider that that protective adult, uh, a protective factor, that relationship with the adult may be a teacher or a principal that, that a kiddo is not seeing every day mm -hmm. physically anymore. And so, um, you know, in, encouraging, um, you know, educators, if they know that they have a great relationship with a, a specific young person in their class. Um, you know, in encouraging them to uh, take some time to, to reach out and maintain that relationship uh, during this remote learning time. Excellent point. It's so important. My, my son is a sophomore. One of my sons is a sophomore at university and his, you know, high school athletic director reached out to him just for a check-in. How's it going? Mm -hmm. And I yeah, just, yeah. I think that's really remarkable. I think that excellent point, you know, you don't know those relationships that, that the FaceTime isn't there now. So just taking that extra second to check in, I think is so critical during this time. Absolutely. I'm wondering if um, in our, our last few minutes, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about maybe the history of the Connect program um, and, and just kind of some of the options. This was such a great overview, but um, mm -hmm. if you wanted to speak to, you know, when we do get back to in-person learning, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are the opportunities available for schools if they want you to come out and deliver a training or if they want to get trained up in um, the full program? 
Kelly, do you want to go or do you? And I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, then you're going to you're going to fill in. I'll um, fill in. Sure. <laughs> so uh, the NAMI, uh, as long as I've been with uh, NAMI New Hampshire for the past 14 years, we have had this national best practice program. Um, and uh, in recognizing and responding to suicide risk um, in all ages um, and with all disciplines, um, with first responders, with schools, with faith leaders, with healthcare providers, both physical and um, mental health, um, as well as with social service and community organizations. And um, we have done those trainings, um, half day trainings, full day trainings, now in, um, in um, compliance with Senate Bill 282, we have a, a two hour training um, for Connect, which is a little bit more expanded from what Kelly and I just very successfully did. Thank you, Kelly. Um, fantastic job. Um, and so uh, we do those trainings in state as well as all across the country. Um, but the bottom line is um, we really, um, we embrace the national best practice protocols of really training any single person. That would be a mechanic. It would be a bartender. It would be a hairdresser. It's any single community member in this universal precaution of knowing the warning signs for suicide. Um, and a lot of times people without letters after their name are often the ones that are best poised to respond to suicide risk and saving lives. Um, so that's kind of um, where we're at with the Connect program. We do have the connectprogram.org website. Um, and um, Ellen, um, it, uh, with Ellen must have our contact information. I know that Elaine DeMello, um, who will be speaking with you in tomorrow's afternoon, Bill, um, she also is a colleague of ours um, with the Connect program. Um, and so you could contact any one of us um, if you needed more information. Kelly? Absolutely. And one of the trainings I just wanted to mention, um, branching off of what Ann said, um, one of the trainings in the Connect program that's near and dear to my heart is the Connect Youth Leader Training, because Ann's precisely right. It's highly unlikely that uh, folks who are struggling are, are going to reach out to that individual with the letters after their last name, right? The alphabet soup that, that gives them the skills needed to intervene in that crisis. They're not doing that. And for peers, they're gonna reach out to other peers. Mm -hmm. And our Connect Youth Leader Training is really an opportunity to empower those peers again, to respond competently and, and really confidently and not trying to you know, de-escalate the crisis or provide any interventions themselves. It's just about connecting them, letting them know as a peer, you're not alone, I'm here. We're gonna get you the help we need from a trusted adult. And I've seen that training in action um, as it shakes out on the regional public health network level. And it's just, it's such a wonderful comprehensive training. I can't say mm -hmm. anything about it. Part of, um, I'll, I'll just give a little nod to my project, a part of the New Hampshire Texas Project 2.0 is to really provide that comprehensive training statewide um, to youth serving organizations um, just so that they can make those connections for folks. So there's absolutely opportunities for training um, through the Connect program that I think will really benefit the communities in our great state. The other thing I would add just to further um, plug your program here that over the next five years, the federal uh, program on behalf of New Hampshire, uh, that NAMI New Hampshire is sort of um, steering, is um, those three regions of uh, North Country, Carroll County, and Capital Region are very much um, highlighted within this grant um, in terms of the great need for resources, and that includes trainings, as well as um, uh, great need um, period in terms of those three areas in our state. However, the Garrett Lee Smith grant that Kelly is overseeing um, will also accommodate the larger state environment as well. Um, so we just wanted to also um, highlight that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I, hopefully folks know, um, you know, they can always reach out to, to our office and we can um, help folks get connected to you and other, you know, suicide prevention resources. 
um, we have met, I think it's, I think it's important for folks in the state to know that all of these partners in suicide prevention are having these conversations. Mm -hmm. We know that, you know, schools are, are now mandated to have, you know, suicide prevention education in place starting July 1st. And um, our team is working with your team. Uh, we're working with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. We're working with Connors Climb. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think having conversations with, um, you know, across community partners, we're all going to have different things to, to offer um, with a common objective. And so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And I think it really speaks to the spirit of collaboration that exists within this state. It's, it's such a wonderful thing to see um, because the partners really do come to the table to wrap around these individuals and families with support, services, resources. That's what it's all about. So, yep. yep. And, and you took the words right out of my mouth, Kelly, about collaboration. And then the other thing I would say is choose hope. Um, working in this field day in and day out for the past 14 years, um, my approach is always about choosing hope. And that, by the way, also applies to other public health issues such as COVID-19 currently that we're dealing with, but it may be other public health issues that we're dealing with in the future. Um, choose hope. What a, that's such a wonderful way to, <laughs> wonderful way to end. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you so very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Um, and um, yeah, just for all of our viewers, um, feel free to leave comments or questions here. We'll check back um, and uh, get you connected to the Connect Ladies if you have further questions about that program in particular, um, or if you're wondering a little bit about NAMI New Hampshire in general, um, definitely a great, great resource. Um, it's a national network and we have a fantastic team in New Hampshire that is taking care of the Grant State. So uh, please definitely check them out, look at their resources and um, reach out to us if you have further comments or questions, anything we can help you with as we all undertake this remote learning time. We'll be back tomorrow for an afternoon bell session. Um, it will be safety in the home. And we're gonna talk a little bit about injury prevention. Um, and even before that, we have our morning coffee chat at 9 a.m. on Facebook Live. So stay tuned for that. And um, you can meet our colleagues there and we can get the morning started off right. It's almost the weekend. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you.